Today I will present uh, something about curiosity as a feature that could be used as intrinsic reward in reinforcement learning. Uh, I want to say something about uh, one feature. Uh, this is curiosity as intrinsic reward in reinforcement learning. So I want to present uh, two models, one in more detail and talk more about something which is called extrinsic and intrinsic rewards and describe uh, curiosity as one of them. And so I believe all of you, if uh, most of you, if not uh, everyone knows how reinforcement learning setting looks like. So just to remind you, we've got an agent an agent lives in some environment and in this environment takes some actions uh, for which receives rewards. So what the agent note about the environment is encoded in the state. So the state uh, have all necessary information for agent to manipulate in this environment. So we know that uh, the reinforcement learning uh, has proven to be useful in many contexts, especially in robot control or uh, video games. I'm more interested today in the latter, and I will prepare examples from video games. And um, 10 years ago, DeepMinds uh, released a, a deep Q network, which is a very general net network structure for learning Atari games. I believe more than 50 games has been evaluated for this, for this task. And DeepMinds uh, learns from the raw sensor input, meaning what we see from uh, the screen is the, the input of the agent. And of course, we control using the joystick pads and receive a reward that are connected to the score to the game. And uh, we can see how it performs uh, for a breakout. So let's see that. So short uh, how it looked like 10 years ago for breakout, we see that the agent barely knows what to do in the first steps. And after some episode, it manages to do something and uh, not uh, pass the ball through the uh, floor. So after other episodes, we can see that uh, it starts to know what to do, how to achieve better results, how to not lose the game. And uh, after some point, uh, as we see the, the agent knows how to operate in this world and manages to find a strategy that maximize the score. So the metric for this task was measured in comparison with uh, human performance. So many games has been measured with uh, comparison to median median human score. And many games for many games, uh, the, this network has outperformed human agents. Uh, there's some other games that uh, DQN was not good enough uh, for, a, let's say, half of them, uh, DQN outperformed human agents on average, but for the rest, it was worse. That was 10 years ago. There was one particular game, and this game, uh, maybe you know, that is Montezuma's Revenge. And for this game, DQ network achieved zero score. That means it didn't do anything good in this game. And the reason behind that is that Montezuma's Revenge is a game for which completing the game needs very serious, a very complex series of tasks. And during this game, we receive points only for collecting items, but it's not necessary to get uh, feedback that we need to, for agent to learn uh, during the game. So for instance, if we want to complete the first level, we need to take some key. 
explore explore the whole different uh, level find some other collectibles we can get and many in many uh, cases we have to go from one edge of the level to another one and avoid many obstacles that are waiting for our agent so this game is extremely hard for the agent but not because it's hard but there is lack of feedback so for the, most of the time the agent doesn't know what to do during the uh, training the items are rare, very 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 rare they are sparse, sparse that means that the feedback is received very very rarely so in many games like that i mean when the reward, rewards are sparse uh, the agent may not well uh, learn because there is uh, not enough feedback that needs to get things uh, right. I mean, there's, the agent needs to know if his actions are okay or not, but until he gets point, he doesn't know if, which of actions that he took were good or not. So in other cases, and the uh, agent uh, may not have any reward defined at all and we need to come up with some kind of solution that applies even if we have no good uh, rewards defined in the environment so before we do that let's say something about extrinsic and intrinsic rewards so what does it mean so extrinsic rewards were are such rewards are coming from external to the agent source. This means environment. So environment is source of extrinsic rewards. And with, in contrast to that, intrinsic rewards are something that are internal to the agent. So not related to the current state, not directly. But there is a problem with that uh, this, the distinction. So uh, let's get through some examples so we know that we can look for uh, extrinsic rewards in the environment and uh, such examples are game points health life loss experience points collectibles uh, and we can uh, have level completion completion or game completion as a reward some of this uh, are more universal than other some more present in the game so for atari games most of them have points if not any for tqn at least uh the experience point may be only for some of them uh, le level completion is quite universal but it's, but it, it's sparse so the problem with that approach is that uh, each uh, environment gives another set of possible rewards so that's the that's the one point and another one is that uh, the question that are extrinsic rewards really external what the, do i mean by that and what i wanted to say is that uh, rewards are not inherent part of the environment and uh, we've got to do two diagrams one uh, explains how rewards are received by the agent in some in certain environment but usually it's the, the case that we've got external environment and uh, our agent knows a uh, part of that and tries to interpret what it sees about the environment and then after this process uh, decide uh, what reward has been to, uh, to be received so the agent needs to interpret the state in order to get a reward this interpretation comes from a critic and this critic uh, has a role to interpret what is the reward coming from the state we receive so we can imagine to make a point that uh, i want to say that rewards are not an inherent part of an environment we interpret environment in a certain way to get certain rewards and we can imagine for, for a thought experiment that we've got a chessbot but 
it is trained not to win a game, but it is encouraged to lose any game by receiving a positive uh, reward for each game that he loses. So I want to say that this, this winning a game is not a universal reward uh, in this environment. We decide what, how we treat the reward, uh, how it, our states in the game as a, as a reward. So this distinction is kind of artificial. There is hard to tell where is the line between extrinsic and intrinsic. So we need to come up with another distinction. So, and uh, Bartol uh, defines that as extrinsic rewards are problem specific rewards. So that means if we've had rewards that are related to a problem or class of problems, we mean an extrinsic reward. And intrinsic rewards are independent of the problem. So we, we can apply them in various settings. So intrinsic rewards are general, where extrinsic rewards need to be applied in some conditions. Of, so, so not all environments may be uh, good for some kind of extrinsic rewards, and extrinsic rewards cannot be applied in each, in each setting. So with, with that in mind, we can approach to one kind of intrinsic reward that is based on one feature of human intelligence, and this is curiosity. So curiosity is a feature that lead so if we imagine what curiosity means it, it means that we are willing to take some actions for of consequences are not known at the time we took the action so we don't need an external reward to, to do something if something is of our interest so that means uh, we are uh, willing to do some take some actions, uh, even if there is no reward guaranteed for that action. So this is as we can understand from uh, our usual life, curiosity it may be applied uh, in rainforest analysis. But before we do that, we need to come up with a more formal way to define what curiosity mean, in what terms to be applied in rainforest and learning study. And this idea is not new. Um, about 30 years uh, ago, Jürgen Schmidhaber proposed one of the uh, approach towards defining curiosity in terms of mo uh, modeling in rainforest and learning settings. And uh, well, that was, as we can read, so model, model the reliability of the predictions of the adaptive predictor at time t spend the function for the model building control system in proportion to the current change of reliability of adaptive predictor. The curiosity goal of the control system is to maximize the expectation of cumulative sum of future positive or negative change in prediction reliability. That, be quite, that was quite dead. So let's try to simplify that into something which is uh, more easy to digest. So, Bartle describes something which is called curiosity unit. So curiosity unit reward is a function of the mismatch between its modeled current predictions and actuality. There is positive reinforcement whenever the system fails to correctly predict the environment. In other words, the more agent is surprised by the event, the better reward he receives. And this re reward is internal. It doesn't assume anything about environment uh, except the part we are somehow able to predict the next, <coughs> excuse me, predict, predict the future somehow. The agent is uh, rewarded when the, the prediction mismatches what, we, what he tried to get from current state. So the more surprised he, he is, the greater re reward is. So it can turn lead to exploring the game, so leading to unknown paths. But on the other hand, it can be 
uh, use for games, for instance, uh, when the agent does, let's imagine um, Super Mario Bros. So we've got an agent and we know that in this game, we are going from left to the right. So the agent is encouraged to go to the right because the, the part of the game is unknown. Uh, and if he wants to explore the game, he needs to move forward. So this is a natural way for in this game that curiosity leads to a natural way for beating the game. So if we are curious what is happening, it's going to have to happen next. Uh, we somehow we are training ourselves to get better and beat the game, and this works not only for Super Mario Bros. but only for but uh, uh, for other games too. But there's one pitfall of this approach, and this is what I call addiction to noise. So unfortunately, I cannot show it because this was videos, but. Uh, Imagine we've got an agent which is curious and the goal, the primal goal of uh, the agent is to go through the maze. And the curious agent may do that because he's curious and wants to explore paths and sooner or later he will find the end of the, of the maze. But imagine we in the second uh, maze we have a tv screen and this tv screen is fed with random images these random images are hard to predict for the agent and the result of this is that when the agent meets such screen it gets stuck and tries to watch this tv because uh, uh, he's curious he cannot predict well the future he faces each at each time and tries to predict uh, next image for uh, and so on and so on but it gets stuck and it loses the attention of the primal of the of the whole whole task so this addiction noise is very serious problem and maybe encountered in uh, naive curious approaches and so we need to come up with a solution and there is a solution and this is called internal curiosity module uh, which was uh, done in a paper curiosity driven exploration by self-supervised prediction by patak agraval efros and daryl uh, several years ago and be before we do that let's uh, categorize types of observations so we've got things that can be controlled by the agent things that the agent cannot control but they can affect the agent we can imagine a uh, enemies in Super Mario Bros. We cannot control them, but if we uh, touch them, we lose the game. So this is the, the second type. So things out of agents control that are not affecting the agent. There's the last uh, category, which is the uh, troublesome for curious agent. Why? Because agent cannot control that. It's not affecting the agent and focuses uh, the agent uh, to something which is not relevant to the problem. So instead of looking of a state, so you can imagine that is a uh, pixel uh, row sensory input from the game. So instead of operating on state, we need some kind of representation that ignores the last type. So how to do that? So the solution uh, comes from internal curiosity module and is like this. So we've got a neural network and uh, we've got classic reinforced learning setting. So we've got, uh, we've got uh, state, a policy that determines which action to has to be taken. And then this action for this action, the agent receives the usual classical extrinsic reward an intrinsic reward that we, comes from this module. And after that, we are in the new state and the process continues. So we've got a state and another state, but instead of looking at the states alone, we need to come up with representation. So ICM, this architecture consists of two modules, forward dynamics module and inverse dynamics module. 
And let's start from inverse dynamics module. What, how, how uh, it works. So this module takes two states, the one and the, the next one, and tries to encode in some way. And this is a neural network that is trained to retrieve the action that has been taken that led it to the next state. So this neural network tries to predict from status what action has been taken. So we went from ST to ST plus one. And this, this network, this internal representation is used for a forward dynamics model, which is, uh, so our, our agent operates on action and uh, representation of a state and tries to predict representation of future state. And then it tries to calculate the difference. If it is big, we are surprised. It's not what we, would do. we thought it's going to happen. So the reward is big. So, but if our prediction is uh, more or less the same, but we are not surprised and we know what is going to happen. So uh, the reward coming from this uh, uh, model is not big. So that's the idea. The idea is quite simple, but it allows to, to get over the problem of addiction to noise. So we can, see how it operates in distorted uh, environment. So to do that, let's see. Okay, so we we saw that uh, that the agent uh, ignores the noise because it doesn't affect the training model that tries to recover the action that has been taken. So it's not relevant to representation of a state. So the state may be different, the representation may be different, but it's robust to such kind of so. Uh, at the end, I want to present briefly another type of uh, curiosity-driven model. It's random network distillation. It's open AI project. Exploration by random network distillation, which is in paper by Barda, Edward Starkey, and Kalimov. And I won't go into details. This is a next state prediction. Next state prediction models are based on uh, giving a state and trying to trying to predict what's going to happen if we take some action A. But this network is quite different. And uh, there's one twist. So we use uh, feature representation as in the previous example. But in this case, we've got a new neural network, which is random. And the most interesting part, which is which uh, that is uh, that it's random, it's never trained. And this network encodes the state, so it's kind of state representation. But this network tries to operate in different uh, state representation than the original one. Uh, but the idea is quite uh, similar. So at the end, I wanted to present how this structure 
performs on Mentezuma's revenge. That is quite hard a game to beat. So let's see. So we can see that a curious agent is more willing to jump because jumping is more exciting and more, uh, more happy if we jump. I wanted to say that uh, the agent uh, uh, was jumping, and uh, because the jumping is more exciting, uh, we can more happens if we jump. And this is a kind of artifact of this uh, of this uh, type of uh, approaches. But it can perform and it can pass the level, so not all the time, but it's still a remarkable achievement that uh, this kind of network is able to explore the game, find necessary ingredients to build the level, and uh, operate well uh, in this environment. And th what is the main benefit, this uh, kind of approaches are universal. That means you can use that in various different environments. And it can perform better or worse, but uh, still, it can do something, and sometimes it even gets better than the classical reinforcement learning settings, which has uh, very predefined rewards. So sometimes it can beat uh, that one. So that's all I wanted to present you. I want to thank you for your attention, and uh, have a nice day.